Welcome to this week's meeting of the Rotary E Club of Silicon Valley. The focus of our club is threefold, education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And we use technology as a tool to meet the goals of Rotary International and our club, which is service above self, or as I like to say it, making the world a better place to live. This week, we have a very special guest and uh, one of our charter members who has been in Rotary for some 33 years, who is going to give us a presentation on one aspect of his passion, which is landscape photography. And I just said to the group before starting this recording that uh, I hope that you will then, after watching this, see the world through different eyes and to look at things in nature around you much differently. And I would like at this time to introduce our club member and Keith Marsh. Now, everyone here in our club should be familiar with Keith because he's the one over the last few months has provided all those excellent video um, photographs, which has inspired each and every one of us. So go ahead, uh, Keith. Thank you, Roger. And thanks for inviting me to, uh, to do the program. Let me share the uh, screen. And start the program here. Okay, uh, can everybody see that? Yeah, are your pictures in the middle of the screen or is that just for me? Is that okay? Okay. All right, so my, uh, my presentation is on landscape photography and um, I I've kind of focused on, play on words, on composition. Uh, because that's kind of the, the, the basics for uh, producing great landscape photography. So I like this, this quote about landscape photography in that um, it, it embodies the, the drama of a, of, a, of a certain place to capture the emotion of the, of the setting you're in. Now, the first rule of photography, hang on one second here. Um, can I move these? these pictures out of the middle some way can't do that okay the first rule of photography what's going on here something's wrong there we go is you got to have a camera now it can be all kinds of different devices you use to to record images um, anything from an iPhone to an iPad uh, to uh, a GoPro or uh, point and shoot, or the uh, the, the bigger uh, DSLR cameras. Now, it used to be that you know a lot of people didn't carry cameras with them. Of course, now with iPhones and so forth, people are almost always uh, taking photos, as you as you know. But when I travel, I usually take you know anywhere from three to five cameras, uh, typically two uh, DSLRs if I'm going on a photo trip. Uh, maybe just one if I'm just doing a, a travel kind of a trip without a lot of focus on photography. Uh, but I usually have a, a, a camera with me almost at all times. I've got at least one in the car, sometimes two. I carry my iPad most of where I go. So um, you can't take a picture with, without a camera. So some of the composition uh, basic components we can go over. Uh, the first kind of the, the primary rule is the rule of thirds. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's kind of the basis for, for composing an image in, uh, in not only landscape, but any kind of photography. Um, the elements of good composition are shapes, forms, light, texture, color, and patterns. Now you might say, well, aren't shapes and forms the same thing? And, and actually they're not. Um, uh, a shape is something like a silhouette of a bird, as opposed to when you put lighting on the bird, you actually get a three-dimensional uh, image of the bird. So the shape is one thing, the form is more of a three-dimensional aspect of it. Um, 
I was once told that most landscape, good landscape photos would have a good foreground, middle ground, and background. And I think that's, that's true in a lot of cases, not always, but uh, I'll show you some images with, uh, with those elements. Uh, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about aspect ratios because those can be used to enhance a photograph, uh, to make it more, more powerful or, or dramatic. And there's several that you can, you can use for that purpose. So rather than just taking the camera as, you know, the, or the picture out of the camera, think about maybe improving it with working on the aspect ratios. Uh, lighting, of course, and the time of day is, is really critical. Uh, as you know, a photograph is nothing more than recording, recording light. And there's all kinds of light. There's direct light, there's, there's uh, uh, soft light, there's morning light, evening light, all kinds of lighting conditions that uh, you can use to enhance your photographs. Time of day is, is sometimes critical. And then I'll uh, go over a, a kind of a list of things to consider and the things uh, you want to try to avoid when you're taking photographs. And it all boils down to, you know, taking, you're going out and, and practicing your photography. Um, it was once said by Henry Brisson uh, that your first 10,000 images are your worst. So indicating that you've got to take a lot of pictures before you start, uh, you know, really getting it down. So this is one quote that I liked about composition, about bringing order to chaos. As you look around you when you're outside, everything is basically visual chaos. And it's up to the photographer to try to find some order in that chaos to create a good image, whether it's landscape or any kind of other image. Uh, that that's what makes a good photograph is getting order out of chaos. So the rule of thirds, uh, just briefly go over what that is and why it's so important to photography. If you take an image and divide it in three sections, both vertically and horizontally, and then look at the intersection of those, those points, you can see the little circles, that's typically where you want to, to put your subject matter. Now, not always, and you can, you can kind of play with it a little bit, but you don't want to put things in general dead square in the middle. Now that's not always true. There's sometimes when you, for dramatic purposes, you want something dead center in the middle, but in general, if you can put things a little off center, it gives more power to it. So that's the rule of, uh, rule of thirds. Another um, interpretation of that by some people is to, to look at the golden uh, rectangle. And the golden rectangle is created um, out of the Fibonacci sequence and the Fibonacci spiral that creates this, this rectangle of, uh, of a geometric pattern. And as you can see, the, the center of that spiral is pretty close to the rule of thirds. So I, th I think the rule of thirds is easier to work with, but the Fibonacci sequence, which is, a, you know, of course, a geometric sequence, um, um, or arithmetic sequence is, is something that people consider. So here's a photograph uh, that has a lot of things in it that we can talk about. Uh, the rule of thirds, uh, we've got the, the gentleman on the, on the right, kind of in that right sweet spot. This photograph was taken at uh, just, just next to Mesa Arch, which is off to the left in Utah, in Arches National Monument, Canyonlands. And this is at morning or early morning sunrise. And there were so many people lined up to take a picture of the arch that I couldn't even get in to take a picture. So I said, I'm gonna go someplace else and find another, another picture. So I walked a few, uh, few yards to the right and found these people sitting on the cliff watching the sunrise. And um, since it was shooting into the sun, I wanted to do an, an HDR image, which is five images. So I asked the people to just stay real still for five seconds while I clicked off five images. Um, but you've got a lot of things going on here with the, uh, the you've got a good foreground with the, the, the sandstone. You've got a middle ground with the people further out. And then of course the, uh, the canyons and the, and, the, and the sunrise and the clouds, dramatic clouds. Uh, you've got some texture in, in the sandstone, which is, you know, very interesting. Um, so there's a lot going on here. The other thing is you'll notice that there's three people sitting there on the, uh, on the edge on the, on the left. Now, three is a really important number 
in photography. If you can get three of something, uh, that's really pretty, pretty cool because it's, it, for some reason, odd numbers are preferred to even numbers. And you got one, three, five, and so forth. But three seems to be the ideal number for having something in, a, in an image. Now, granted, you've got one guy on the right and three on the left, but you really got the one and the three. So you've got really powerful uh, stabilization of, of numbers in this, in this picture. <clears throat> so some things to consider when you're taking photographs is to uh, you know, look for clouds and storms for dramatic skies. Whenever I see a big storm coming in, what, the first thing I do is go grab my camera and, and look for some uh, dramatic uh, skies to photograph. Of course, you don't want to go out in, in rain or thunderstorms, but uh, if you can capture some images with, with nice puffy clouds, it, it's, it's really pretty dramatic. Um, early light, late light, soft light, those are all kind of the best kind of lighting conditions to look for. Um, soft light, like an overcast day, it's almost like a, a soft box where the, where the sun is, is illuminating the, the clouds and providing a nice even light to your subject matter. Uh, reflections, shadows, and people in, a, in an image are, are all something that add interest. Uh, you can use them in different, different shapes and forms and so forth, but um, uh, I like to have people doing some kind of an activity. It also gives perspective to the, the image and how how immense the particular situation might be, the location. Uh, the main thing you want to do is try to isolate, though, to make it, you know, getting order out of chaos sometimes means just focusing in. I heard, heard a photographer once say, if your photo's not good enough, it, you're not close enough. So zero in on, on things that are important in the, in the scene and, and eliminate things that are not important. A lot of uh, what we call negative space, you want to get rid of things like that. So keep it simple. And then try to find something unique going on. You know, it could be a person riding a bicycle or somebody flying a kite, uh, something going on that just adds a little bit of interest to the photograph and to the landscape than just having a, just a straight, you know, shot of, of mountains and, and trees. And then the other thing is to try to be creative. Um, there's a lot of rules in photography and they all can be broken if it's for the right reason. I've got a photography friend who actually went out and, and intentionally tried to break every single rule in photography and he did it, you know, systematically and was, you know, did it and was very powerful in, in the images he was able, able to create by breaking the rules. So here's an image that uh, has a lot of landscape uh, aspects to it. This is a photograph that won the Rotarian Magazine uh, contest uh, three years ago. It's a picture of a, an old dead tree at Crater Lake. And uh, there's a couple of things. You've got the rule of thirds going on here with the tree that's a little bit off center. You've got a really good foreground with the tree. You've got a good middle ground with the island, the wizard, wizard island in uh, the lake. And then you've got the Milky Way. Now the, the tree is about 10 feet from my wide angle lens. You've got Wizard Islands about maybe two miles away. And the Milky Way is 25,000 light years. So if you wanna talk about the extremes of foreground, middle ground and background, that's about as, as, as vast as you can get. Uh, I've used lighting on the tree from uh, uh, the setting sun just after, after sunset to uh, enhance that. And then uh, the actual, the, the, uh, the judge who picked this as the winning photograph uh, made a comment about the tree and the Milky Way creating an inverted V, which he felt was, was a powerful uh, image uh, or aspect of the image. Um, so I think that's, you know, pretty much sums up the, the landscape co composition components of, of that picture. Here's one I took in Africa last year on a rotary water trip. And uh, a lot of things going on here too. Uh, notice that the tree is not dead center and that the, uh, the, the upper part of the tree is, is, is just a silhouette. It's, it's, we'd call that the form now we, or the shape. Uh, lower down you, you see more of the, the, the three-dimensional aspect of the tree. Um, <clears throat> it gives it some, some shape and so forth. You've got some hippos in the uh, in the pond there for some interest. You've got a nice 
dramatic sunset. You've got some nice landscape. So you've got all kinds of things going on in this picture uh, to, to make, you know, to give it some interest. Here's a picture I took up in uh, northern Idaho where I grew up in the area called the Palouse. And once, once again, uh, it just so happened we were out shooting and these big storm clouds came in. And uh, there was some lightning along with it, but uh, we were able to get some really nice shots uh, of, this, of these barns with the big, big storm clouds rolling in um, behind it. Uh, here's a picture up in uh, of Mount McKinley in uh, Alaska, and um, we've got what we call a leading line. That road going in from the middle off to the right and back around leads your eye right up to the mountain, and that's a really powerful thing to have in a picture. Uh, I also wanted to have something else going on, so I, I included a couple of the tour buses there so you get, get some perspective on um, the, the size of, of the mountain. And we just happen to be lucky that this is one of the few days that you could actually see the mountain. It's usually, you know, in, 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 in clouds and in and, and fog and you can't really see it most of the time. Uh, another day where the, the big puffy clouds came out and I grabbed my camera and, and went into San Francisco to to shoot around with the, with the different scenes. We've got a, a beach scene here with some kids playing in the water for added interest. The big puffy clouds, so you've got a good foreground, middle ground, and background once again, and some interest in, the, uh, in what's going on. Kind of identifies uh, the, the beach there. Uh, this picture's all about texture and colors. Uh, this was taken in southern or southeast Utah. And uh, I just wanted to focus on the, the changing colors in the aspens. You've got all different shades of, of color uh, in with the, uh, with the stand, sandstone cliffs. So that's all that this is about, is color and texture. Um, here we have a picture where we've, I've zoomed in, gotten really in tight on this little waterfall. This was up in, in Glacier National Park. And I used a little bit longer shutter speed to, to get the water to, to, to be a little foamy and, 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 and soft. Uh, but it's about isolating this one little aspect of the waterfall within this total landscape. Uh, Yosemite, uh, the Merced River, this is shooting into the sun at morning. And uh, to me, this really gives a feel for the, for the place. It almost feels like you know, a cold fall morning, which it was, you can almost feel the temperature drop. But with that rising sun, you, you kind of know that later on in the day, it's going to be nice and toasty once that sun gets up and starts warming the valley. Uh, here's a, an image with a lot of things going on. Uh, we've got the patterns on the fields in the, on the left. This was taken from an, from an airplane over the Palouse. So we've got patterns. We've got the rule of thirds with that green line coming down that creek a uh, little creek coming down between the two different fields. And then you've got that tree with the shadow. Now the shadow would, would be the shape of the tree and the tree itself would be the form because it's lit by the, by the sun and has a three dimensional feel to it. So you've got a lot of, a lot of different things going on in this picture uh, compositionally that makes it more uh, interesting. Uh, this picture is from Havana, Cuba. Uh, there at the harbor. And what makes this picture is those three bikes there in the front. And uh, it's actually the three seats on the three bikes that I think are important. You'll notice that I did cut off the one bike and some people may, might say, well, you don't, you don't want to cut that off. You want to have the whole bike. And I, I would disagree. I think what's important here is the three seats. And uh, the fact that that one is cut off is almost symbolic of the fact that Cuba has been cut off from trade with the U.S. For, for so long. Uh, you notice that the, the horizon is, is pretty much dead level. And um, uh, I think this makes a, a really interesting, uh, almost a, a travel image of Havana. Now this is not really a landscape picture, but I wanted to show that, you know, all pictures don't have to be in sharp focus. This was taken in, uh, in Cuba, a girl walking down the street and I used a show, slow, slow shutter speed and I moved the camera up and down 
to get this feel of motion that she has when she's walking down the street. So all pictures don't have to be sharp. They, for a certain reason, they can be you know, soft or whatever. Here's another picture of something that's, that's soft and, and moving. This is in the aspen trees of Utah, just moving the camera up and down, taking a slow shutter speed with the uh, aspen uh, colors, you know, intermixed with the, with the bark of the aspen. A little bit about aspect ratios. Um, most people think that uh, landscape photography has to be a horizontal image and not vertical, but that's not true. I'll show you some in a, in a minute here that um, are, are vertical images that are very powerful landscapes. Uh, square, one-to-one uh, -one ratio. Uh, it's not common in landscape, but in certain cases, uh, it, it's, it can be very powerful in isolating uh, a certain a certain part of the landscape that you want to you want to focus on. Uh, you know the standard uh, image from out of your camera is typically a four by six ratio. That's that's good for for most standard prints. Um, but it's kind of to me it's kind of a boring uh, aspect ratio because so many pictures are shown in that in that uh, in in that format. Uh, you got the golden rectangle once again, the Fibonacci uh, from the Fibonacci sequence. It's a little bit wider than four by six, and some people think that's a very, very pleasing aspect ratio uh, for images. Um, a lot of my friends that do a lot of landscape photography like the one to two ratio. It's a little bit wider, uh, kind of a mini pano, and I think it's dramatic. And I'm starting to use it more and more. Uh, and in certain cases where I think it, it can enhance the, dr the drama of the image. And then you've got the super wide panos. And um, I've, I've learned over time that the, the, if for your cover photos on Facebook, if you want to crop it in advance, the, the right ratio is 20 to 55. <laughs> so even though you can, you can readjust it in, in, in Facebook, that's the ratio that, that they use for the cover photo. So here's an image, uh, landscape image, taken at the Natural Bridges in, um, in Utah. And uh, I'm including this because this won the Landscape Award at the Marin County Fair several years ago. This is one of the very first images that I took of the Milky Way. And I took it in the vertical format. And uh, some people were, were kind of shocked that a vertical image would win the Landscape uh, uh, Award at the, at the County Fair. Here's another one that's in the vertical format. Um, once again, we have very dramatic foreground, middle ground, and background. Uh, when I took this picture, it was so dark that I could not see those rocks that were like two feet in front of me. And the only thing that's illuminating those rocks is the light from the Milky Way, which is 25,000 light years away. So that's how how much light comes from the stars, not only the, the main part of the Milky Way, but all of the stars in the sky. It's quite a bit of light. <clears throat> now here's a, a, a big panorama that I took at Yosemite several years ago. I think I used eight, eight pictures uh, you know, on a panorama and then I spliced them together to get this image that goes all the way from North Dome uh, to Half Dome, Glacier Point, Sentinel, Sentinel Dome, and then all the way around to almost to El Capitan. The original picture was even wider than this, but this is kind of the extremes of the of the valley um, in this panorama. Now I've cropped this down. This is the two to one ratio, one to two ratio, that I think is appealing because uh, you've got Half Dome, Glacier Point, and Sentinel Dome all in the same picture, and it gives kind of a dramatic uh, you know image of the valley. Uh, I think it works pretty well. And then this is the, the golden rectangle, which is a little bit narrower, uh, not quite a four, a little bit wider than a four by six. But in this image, you've got, you know, Half Dome and Glacier Point um, pretty well identified in the picture. Uh, cityscapes can also be, you know, very dramatic and use a lot of compositional elements. Uh, the picture on the top, you've got a lot of different patterns going on from the arches and the Embarcadero to the, uh, you know, the lines in the buildings, even the diagonal lines in the Embarcadero Center. 
Um, so lots of things going on. You've got the ferry, ferry boat there uh, for interest. And uh, I think it works in black and white, obviously. And then the one on the bottom is just a little bit wider panorama of the, um, of the same scene. This was taken from a uh, you know, ferry boat out in the bay. Okay, some things to avoid. Um, what I see all the time is, you know, unlevel horizons, especially when you have, you know, water or oceans in the picture. There's nothing worse than seeing a picture where it's tilted and you, you, know, you wonder, why didn't they just turn the camera a little bit and straighten it out? Because it's very distracting to have an un, unlevel horizon in my, uh, my estimation. Uh, and you can you can fix that in most even in your in your camera in your uh, your iPhones uh, the apps that can can straighten that out so you can you can fix it basically in camera in, in a lot of cases uh, but make sure your horizons are level um, try to avoid avoid really harsh lighting you know midday sun overhead uh, creates a lot of shadows uh, it, it's very distracting to have really bright spots and very dark shadows with no detail so if you can avoid that time of day it's, it's good not to say you can't take good pictures at midday with bright sun but it just is more challenging um, negative space is big areas where there's really nothing going on and i'll show you an image here in a minute on, on how negative space is is not something that's generally good once again uh, all these rules can be broken uh, for the for the right reason uh, border distractions uh, things around the edge of the picture that don't really add and are kind of a, dis a distraction to the viewer um, that can easily be cropped out or removed um, you know should be you know should be paid attention to uh, one of the photographer judges that I've heard over the years calls it border patrol and where you go around the border of the picture to look for anything that is not supposed to, supposed to be there and uh, try to get rid of it in one way or the other. And then um, don't be afraid to break the rules. Um, you know, every rule that's out there can be broken and try to think of ways to break it, break a rule for the right reason. So here's a picture I took just uh, a couple weeks ago on the golf course just to kind of show you um, how you can improve a picture. I intentionally took a bad picture, or what I consider a bad picture, so I could show you how to improve it. Uh, you've got a lot of negative space in the sky. It's a very uninteresting sky, overcast, uh, without much detail. You've got a lot of negative space on the lower left with the, with the, gr the grass. Uh, it's not really doing anything for you. Uh, you've got two pull carts on the right, and one of them is kind of cut off. Uh, I would like to keep one of them that's the full one just to kind of give context to the, the activity of walking the golf course. Now you notice there's something on the ground there behind it. I think it's maybe a golf glove and I'd like to get rid of that. And there's also, there's a golf cart in the background on the right. And I kind of want to keep that because it kind of gives co context to the situation. So there's a few little things you can, you know, you can do also to kind of clean up you know, fix a few divots, uh, you know, make the lawn look more uh, uniform, a little gardening here and there with Photoshop. So I've taken this picture and then this is what I come up with. And once again, this was just one that I just shot just to kind of experiment with. Uh, I've cropped it down. I've removed that half golf cart on the, on the right. I've eliminated a bunch of the grass on the left. I did make it in a two to one format because I wanted to keep my friend Gary kind of in the rule of thirds position. And if I cropped it any, any narrower, he would have been right in the middle of the picture. So I wanted to, I wanted to avoid that. And I think it, it provides a good drama to the, to the image by, by using this particular aspect ratio. So uh, beyond your, your smartphones and your iPads and that kind of thing. There's, there's some advanced things you can do if you, if you get into DSLRs and Photoshop that can really make some dramatic pictures. Um, one that I use quite often is HDR, which stands for high dynamic range. And that's basically the, the range of, of whites to blacks to get the full range. The, the camera has a fairly narrow uh, dynamic range if, it's, if you take just one single picture. Um, the, the blacks are, are usually 
too black and the whites are too white. But by increasing the dynamic range with, with multiple exposures at various exposures, you can, you can really increase the dynamic range of a picture and make it much more appealing and look more like what you actually see when you're, when you're out there. You've probably taken pictures in the past where you took this great picture, you come back and you download it and open it up and you say, oh God, that's not what I thought I, I, what it looked like. How do I make it look like what it was like when I was there? And that's, that's a lot of the reason is that you've lost a lot of the dynamic range because the camera can't see like human eyes can see. Um, another thing I've learned to do um, is use focus stacking. And once again, you take multiple pictures at different focal lengths and then stack them in Photoshop to get very, very sharp images all the way through. I'll show you one in a, in a moment. Um, ISO compensation is something that I learned a couple years ago, and it's probably the best thing since sliced bread as far as um, having um, things in your, in your camera that can uh, uh, make taking pictures a lot easier without a lot of adjustments for exposure and aperture and so forth. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then uh, I typically, when I'm taking pictures, I try to keep my camera on aperture priority to keep my, so I, I can control my depth of field. Uh, the small, really small apertures will, will be focused all the way through. Um, and the, the wider, when you have it wide open, it's gonna be very narrow, uh, very narrow range of focus. And so you might have something in the front that's in focus, but everything behind it out of focus. And you might want that or you might not want that. So um, something to consider. So high dynamic range is something that I use quite often. Uh, it involves either three, three, five, seven, or multiple images, usually an odd number. Uh, a tripod is preferred, although you can do it without using a tripod. And then there's several programs that you can use to combine the pictures. Uh, I use both Photomatix and Aurora uh, for combining my images. And then within that, they give you different presets. You kind of pick the ones you like. Um, so here's a picture of the San Rafael Bridge that I took several years ago. The one in the upper right-hand corner is the one that was taken at, at a neutral exposure. And then there's two that are overexposed and two that are underexposed. So those are the five images that I used that I loaded into my HDR program to come up with this image. So this really shows the, the highlights and the shadows of the clouds, and it really is kind of what it looked like that day. Although some people might think it's a little bit too much, too much over the top in, in, the, in the drama of the pictures. Um, and I kind of almost like it more in a black and white version, which is this one here. So I just converted it to black and white for this image. So this is uh, an image that I uh, made with photo, uh, with focus stacking. So I took uh, I, two or three images at, uh, I focused on the little flower there on the front for the first picture. And I wanted to have the, the surf in the background at point rays in sharp focus also. So I took another picture, of course on a tripod, and then I, into Photoshop, I just combine the two pictures and it automatically will take the sharpest parts of both pictures and put them together to give you a really sharp foreground, middle ground, and background for this uh, particular landscape. <coughs> and then I just like this quote from Ansel Adams that, uh, um, as you know, he was a trained uh, concert pianist and uh, for him to say that he almost could hear music when he shot, saw a good picture is kind of fun. And then here's a, my website. This is just my regular business website, but on that I have some links to some of my uh, photography if you wanna, if you wanna see more. Very, fairly simple uh, website. Okay, so any questions? So I guess I have to stop sharing here. Thank you, Keith, for just a wonderful presentation. Um, you've uh, stretched my knowledge of um, landscape photography. And uh, at this point in time, I would uh, uh, like to call on either Shags or Rushton to um, ask any questions that they would like to um, to ask. I can't stop the story. <clears throat> Actually, Keith already answered it with that photo of his friend in the golf shop. In the golf shot, 
which was, do you ever take a wider shot and then crop it into different images to see what you'd like to compose it with? I had done a lot of photography back in the black and white days of the, the 70s when I was shooting for the high school yearbook and the newspaper. So uh, it was it was a lot of fun. And I, I never really did get into the digital when it shifted to that because I had kids and it was a much more expensive hobby than was film, especially black yeah. and white. Actually, but, I, I do that quite often. I do have some friends though who say they never crop. They just, they just know how to take the picture. Mm -hmm. and do it but I, I crop all the time <coughs> do beautiful work thank you thank you thank you Rushton very cool stuff so I was thinking specifically about the, the images with the Milky Way in them and I suspect I'm actually asking the question the wrong way but is it is it shutter speed that allows you to have it open longer to let it more light that's the term and if so how long did it take to get those uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't hear the first part of the question. Um, what was the first part, Rushton? So uh, we get. I think we're getting some feedback from um, maybe Shags there. So the the uh, how long does the does the camera need to be taking in the picture? And, and there's there's a photography term for that that's escaping me at the moment for your Milky Way pictures to work out. Like what what is it you do to 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 see the Milky Way in a way that with a naked eye we don't. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. And um, I talked about it when I did my program on the Milky Way uh, before, and I've also got it on my website. On, and I think it's on my, my website, a, a link to my night photography. But for the Milky Way shots, I basically shoot a uh, 15 second exposure at 6400 ISO. Um, and I've got to use a, a, a 2.8 wide angle lens and there's some other, other things, uh, noise reduction and so forth. But it, it takes a long exposure. Now, if you go much longer than, uh, I used to shoot at 30 seconds, at 3200, but I was starting to get a little bit of, uh, not star trails, but the, the, because the, the Earth is rotating and the stars are moving relative to the camera, <coughs> I would get some elongation of the stars in some cases. So that's when I went to 15 seconds with my new camera that could really have uh, excellent noise reduction uh, at 6400 ISO. So now I don't seem to have any star movement at all uh, at 15 seconds. So that seems to work for me. And then I do some enhancement in Photoshop to kind of pop things out a little bit. Some things I've learned to make it a little more dramatic, but just a little bit, you know, not, not a lot. Because it is, when you see the Milky Way, as you've all probably seen in the past, it doesn't look like what you what the camera sees the camera can pick up a lot more light than the human eye can can pick up so you know that's the great thing about cameras is it can see a lot more than we can very cool thanks one's uh, a couple questions uh keith on the um picture that you um that wherein you won the Rotary uh, Scholarship, uh, this, this Rotary Award for Best Picture. Um, what was your ISO settings and your aperture and shutter speed on that uh, for that setting for that picture? Okay, now that one was one I took with my older camera, and I was using 30 seconds at 3200 ISO, <coughs> and my my lens was a um, was a uh, 2.8, you have to have a really fast lens, which means a, a small f-stop, uh, or so you can get wide open and let, let a lot of light in. So f2.8, 30 seconds, 3200, those three numbers are kind of critical for that picture. Now, if I were to do it today, I'd probably shoot 15 seconds at 6400 and get just as good a picture, if not maybe a little bit better. The second question that I have about that picture is whereabouts did you focus? Well, one thing nice about the, the lens that I use, it's a Nikon uh, wide angle, uh, 14 to, to 24 millimeter lens, and a really, really wide lens like that, you really don't have to worry about focusing too much because almost everything is going to be sharp in that, in that picture. So I didn't, in the, in the first picture I took just after the sunset of the tree, 
I did focus specifically on the tree. But then later for the for the night sh the, the sky, I just changed the the focus just a little bit to get to infinity to do the to do the second shot. Uh, so that there are a little bit different focal lengths in those two pictures. It's kind of like focus stacking, but not but not quite. Are you saying that you took two picture uh, two pictures and made it into one? Yes, I almost always do that. And that's that's how my photography is different than most other people that do the astrophotography. <clears throat> most people will just take one picture at maybe 11 o'clock at night. And then unfortunately, if, it's, if there's no other lighting source, it's gonna be just blacked out. So they might use a, a flashlight or a flash or something to illuminate the object that they wanna show in the picture and I find that very distracting. I don't like it at all. So I've always avoided doing that. And what I do is I'll spend anywhere from four to six hours in getting there early when the light's still up in the sky. And then just before it gets dark, I'll take my first picture so that I can get some light on the foreground. And then I'll wait, like I say, for from four to six hours. And I'm just doing nothing for four to six hours. The camera's on the tripod. It's not moving. I cover it up. I just wait until the Milky Way comes up at maybe midnight or one o'clock, and I'll take my second shot. And then in Photoshop, I'll very carefully combine the two images to make it look like it's one image. So that's how I am a little bit different than almost any other astrophotographer that's, that's doing this. Thank you. At this point in time, uh, for the viewers, um, you will notice at the bottom of our meeting that there's a comment section. Please leave a comment and um, Keith will come back during the, um, uh, the, the, pro, the meeting, uh, the, the date of the, uh, the week of the meeting and answer those questions. But if you are a guest or a member, please do not forget to fill out the attendance form. And if you are a guest and you're a Rotarian, by putting in your correct email address, what will happen is we will send to you a receipt for what you can give to your club secretary. Now, I'm gonna turn the meeting back to, um, uh, to Keith for his last uh, words of wisdom. Well, thanks, Roger. Um, you know, the only thing I can say is to go out and start shooting. Um, can you hear me all right? We have some chat. Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, Henry Cartier-Bresson said, your first 10,000 images are your worst. So, uh, you know, you gotta take 10,000 pictures before you get that next good one. So just get out and, and practice, uh, you know, study photography as much as you can, uh, even join a, a photo club. That's a pretty, pretty good way of, um, of learning more about photography. So that's how I did it. You can do it too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Roger.